Well, hey, this is Dr. Scott Langford. I'm a professor of English at Foothill College, and I'm also the director of communications for the Stanford Gen Global Edu Educators Network YouTube channel. And I am thrilled to be here today with a panel of four different women, all of whom are featured in this new best-selling International Women of Color Who Boss Up book. And I'll be speaking to each one of them in turn about how they got involved with the book, what does it mean to boss up, how did, and how, um, how is this book important to community college educators and community college students in particular. And one of the four is a former Foothill College community college student. I guess I'll have to ask the other three if they ever took any classes at community colleges. I didn't even do that ahead. And full disclosure, I have not met three of the four of these four women before. So I'm asking very basic and maybe sometimes slightly off target questions so that I can figure out who they are too. So with me today, I'll just quickly give you the names and then we'll, we'll speak to each of them individually. Sheena Yap Chan, Suneha Gandhi White, Carmel Jean-Francois and Dr. Tanya Blackman. Welcome to the Stanford Gen channel. So Carmel Jean-Francois was born in Brooklyn, raised in Queens. She's a motivational speaker and the founder CEO of CFIT Coaching. She's beautiful, strong and fit. I'm excited to talk with her because she's been in the fitness industry for a long time, worked with celebrity trainers um, and by the way, uh, since I have read the book, uh, Carmel, I also know that you have quite a dramatic story in terms of your own uh, journey to your current level of fitness yeah. and health. So first of all, welcome to the Stanford Gen channel. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> Great. Now, um, I think I'll, I'll put out the question in that general way and let you kind of take it any direction you want, because right now, boy, there's a lot of avenues open, right? But I will start with how did you become involved with this particular book, um, International Women Who Boss Up? Wow, I feel like um, I was definitely lucky. Um, I, my family is international and I say that I am first generation Haitian American. Um, so I grew up in very Haitian household and um, I never considered myself African American. I didn't, I couldn't relate to um, the African Americans that were around. I went to Catholic school my whole life. So even the, the I didn't go to school with African Americans. Um, and us being here and my family being so receptive and so um, open to other cultures. Now our family is like the United Nations. My cousin married um, a Chinese woman and um, she is an amazing woman. She's a motivational speaker. She speaks on so many different platforms and stages. She's been all around the world. She was in um, Abu Dhabi collecting a prize for her work in um, uh, as an advocate for women. And she is my mentor. And she says, hey, cousin, I just finished the book, Asian Women Who Boss Up. And I think you should be in the next installment, International Women of Color Who Boss Up. And because she's so amazing, I knew she wasn't going to steer me wrong. And I definitely looked into it and I saw it was an amazing project. And because she was finishing it up um, uh, right along with Sheena, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to jump on this. And oh boy, oh boy, do I not regret, regret that decision to jump on board with this project. So that's how I got into the book. Wow, that is a beautiful answer. Um, now let me let me ask a similar question again. Do you have um, a boss up moment in your own life that you want to share? I have to admit, there's a pretty unforgettable one in the in the early intro to the book. Um, <laughs> but I there may be more since we haven't met before. But um, can you share a boss up moment in your own life um, in terms of how you in terms of how you yourself had to boss up? Well, Scott, I'm curious to hear yours, but let me tell you what what I was thinking when I heard you ask that question. Um, to Sheena and Saneha. Um, my moment of bossing up was admitting that I was a boss. 
literally speaking, oh, <laughs> literally speaking, um, I have a, a company in the construction industry. I've been doing that for 11 years. Whoa. And um, I work with architects, engineers, contractors, uh, and I make sure I go to the New York City Department of Buildings. I make sure that their plans get approved with the city and I get their permits and I finish up their jobs for them. Um, and the, the, the term that my title is called a filing representative or an expediter because we expedite the process. And I never looked at it as a big deal. And I never when I started my business and I was excited, I, I, I was the boss. I um, am a boss to four other women of color. Um, actually, it's me and a partner, and we and together we employ five women of color. And it, it that's not what we set out to do, right? We opened an office, and we said l l we we need some employees. We need help in this, and um, it just so happened that. Um, that, that's what we got. I have um, an Indian woman, I have an African American, I have a Latina girl who uh, college aide and, and she's off to law school in a couple of weeks. And, and I feel ultra blessed, but only until last year did I step up and say, I have something amazing. I've done something amazing for the last 10, 11 years. And I never put it out there before people say, hey, what do you do? I'm like, yeah, um, I do X, Y, Z. And I would never say that it's my company. It's my business because I didn't think that people wanted to hear it. And I never owned up to it until last year. I said, I've got something freaking amazing here. And that's my moment of bossing up, really coming forward, knowing that I had created, done, participated in, um, and delegated and, and manicured something so beautiful in, in a male industry, in a male-driven um, industry, dominated industry. And so that's when I feel like I came into my bossness. <laughs> oh, I love that phrase. That's a new way to say it, came into my bossness. And you know what is fascinating here is that this is a theme I didn't really expect is that all three of you so far will have to hear from Dr. Tanya soon. Like this is a transformative year for you in terms of bossing up. And I, I, I guess I, you know, I didn't fully expect that part. I mean, I have to say it's been quite a transformative year for me too. I guess it's been a transformative year for the planet. So many, yeah. Not in such a positive way with, with all three of you, despite, like, despite the challenges. Um, we had Foothill College, uh, Dr. Cornell West came and spoke just before the pandemic, about two months before the pandemic hit. And Dr. West, he says many things that I always quote, but this one really hit me hard that day because we could see, we could see the, we, well, what we could see was the, elect, was, the, was the election crisis coming at that point. But he said, artists, artists meet crisis with creativity and courage. And I, I really feel that you all have done this in this year and you've done it this year as well, which I think is kind of an exciting dimension of the interview, which I didn't, which I admit, I didn't even know that one was coming. <laughs> now, Carmel, I think for your, I think I'm going to take you up on the challenge. And once again, I'm going to screen share from the book, partly because I want to make sure that people know that this book is absolutely amazing. And so here's another page in which you're introduced, but this was the part that I was thinking of. Um, and maybe you can comment on this as well. So it says, um, prior to all that, Carmel studied martial arts. You left that part out so far. <laughs> Competed in tournaments and taught it after achieving her black belt. She then remained sedentary for nearly a decade. It was Carmel's involvement in a car accident from which she underwent two surgeries after suffering multiple injuries, including a broken hip and a broken foot that propelled her journey towards becoming a fitness expert. And then I will not read the next two or three paragraphs, although this journey is absolutely amazing. So Carmel, can I get you to comment on, on that part of your life? I have to say, I'm also gonna say, I can't believe that, I can't believe that like you, you needed, I wish, you, I wish I'd known you earlier because like saying, saying to the world, oh yeah, I just, I'm a woman of color who owns a successful, construction business <laughs> like that ought to, you that ought to be something that is that is something pretty special in the world it shouldn't be as special as it is but wow 
what an achievement. But what about the fitness, the fitness coaching side of your life? How does that fit in? That fits in. I feel like um, it's it will be a, a, a part of my life forever, simply because I love it. And the reason why I love it was be mostly because of this car accident that I was a part of. Now, don't get me wrong. I was always a tomboy and I always wanted to run track and and I always wanted to do those things. And so I jumped into this um, opportunity to study martial arts because um, my creative side led me to making flyers and kind of marketing for for this new um, martial arts teacher that was in the neighborhood. He says, do my posters and my flyers for me and you study for free. I joined and I brought my sister along with some of my girlfriends and we studied, we were in, in college with nothing else to do. So if we weren't home, we were at the dojo, mom knew that. <laughs> so because we studied so much, um, so consistently, we were able to earn our black belts within two years. So that was um, an incredible um, journey in and of itself. Lots of bruises, lots of years. Yeah, two wow. years. Yes, because we were there. All the, if we weren't home, we were at the dojo. I'm, I'm not kidding when I say that. We were 18, 19. Actually, no, we were like 21, 22 with nothing else to do but train. And because we were doing it with friends, and that's one of my main things when it comes to fitness. Do your activities, your workouts, your fitness with friends. People, it, it takes a support group, right, for us to be able to say, I'm going to do it, to hold us accountable. And that's that's how I was able to do this in two years. I joined with my friends and the other people that were there. We made friends, so we became a family and we were able to do this so, so quickly. But after that, I settled into real life, Scott, and I started working and, and slowly fitness just came, became like, wasn't not, a, was not a part of the picture anymore. Mm -hmm. And about 10 years, I didn't want anything to do with exercise. I just wanted to be my pretty old little, you know, skinny self. And I knew it wasn't happening, Scott. I knew I was headed in the direction of my parents. My father had adult diabetes, type two. My mom had hypertension. And I knew I was headed in that direction because the scale was, the, the numbers on the scale was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But I still didn't want anything to do with exercise. I said, I'll just change my diet. But I got into a car accident accident one night. I fell asleep while I was driving, crashed into a pole. Um, surgeries later and broken bones later, they sent me home after six days in the hospital and I didn't want to leave the hospital. I felt so weak. I felt like if I so much as bumped into a wall, I would just fall apart literally. But I went home and guess what? I didn't break myself. In fact, I got stronger. My doctor said, we need you to eat and we need you to take in those calories. That's what's going to help you heal. And we need you to keep moving. For the first time, Scott, I didn't look at fitness and nutrition as something fun to do with my friends. For the first time, I looked at it as something my body needed in order to heal. So for the first time, I saw how fitness and nutrition played its role in helping my body sustain the injuries and heal itself from the injuries. And so when I saw this happening, I said, well, what else can my body do? And that's what really propelled me into my fitness. And it's a constant desire to keep challenging myself, my body, learning about what I can do, learning about what my limitations are and overcoming them and taking people along on this journey with me. So whoever wants to be better, feel better about themselves, like what they see in the mirror with or without clothing, I got you. And that is my message because I knew that it took people around me, people who know me, love me and said, and supported me for me to do what I could do after sustaining those injuries from my car accident. So that's what I wanna serve to other people in my business. Fantastic answer. Let me tag one little extra question on, and it's really not a trick one. You did mention college, but I didn't, I didn't remember to ask you if any of your college career or any of your family's college careers, by the way, have included community college. No, <laughs> I went to the Fashion Institute of Technology, however. Um, yes, yes. So the, it was a two, I studied interior design and it was a two, um, it, it, I just went first for my associates because that's, that's the way 
that program ran, go for your associates, and then you go on for your bachelor's. So that portion, the, the two years that I did for my associates was kind of like my yeah. community college sure. type, um, yes, type education. So that's the way I can. <laughs> that's a great way to answer the question, honestly. That's a great way to answer the question. Yes. So where did you get the business skills? Like, does that part of the, 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 the Fashion Institute's training or what? Like, you, no, it did you have to learn that on the job? Like, it's amazing that you have, I'm still completely gobsmacked that you're out there running this, this business in the you know, I, Scott, quite honestly, I'm still figuring it out, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm still figuring this business thing out. But when I first started with the construction, I was my boss, I was working for an architect mm -hmm. and um, he happened to leave the business and was kind of forced back in for reasons we don't have to get into. But he says, Carmel, wouldn't you like to start your own filing representative business and wouldn't you like to do that? So, and he says, I'm here, I will help you every step of the way. How could I not take advantage of an offer like that? So, and that's exactly what he did. He pretty much, he became dad. He used to help me and my business partners start this, launch it. He helped us register ourselves. He held us by the hands and said, this is what we're going to do next. And then he just kind of like, let us go like proud, like a proud papa and said, go and spread your wings. And for, and even till this day, we still do work for him. He is one of our clients. And um, so th without that, you know, like a lot of times I was just on a clubhouse last night with a woman that says, sometimes you have to see yourself through somebody else's eyes because they sometimes see in you what you cannot. And I was, um, this was 11 years ago. So I was just pretty much like going with the flow. I was making money. I knew, I knew my work and I enjoyed it. And he stopped me and said, Hey, listen, open your own, start your own. And I entertained that for a little bit. Then I said, why the heck not? I'll be doing the same thing that I'm doing just now for myself. I'll be boss. I'll be able to run the show. I can have my own hours. And then I slowly realized that having a business like that, my own hours meant all hours, but that's another topic. There you go. Well, you know, and it's a wonderful echo of what Suneha was saying about the, the importance of finding allies and mentors Yes. Male or female. I mean, I'm glad to hear that sometimes they can be male. I mean, I certainly believe that in my life, but but somebody who will really stand behind you in that way. And that's a beautiful example of how he saw something in you, stuck with you and helped you to change your life in a really deep and significant way. And finding those people in your life and sticking with them on your side is um, is a major message of the book, and 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 um, I think also to be proud of community college is a major mes message of community college. I think one reason you see so many students who do thrive in community college, as Seneha had done, I saw that personally, is that and it was far from just me. She found allies and mentors, and that was a, that made a deep difference for her. And that's at our best. That's what Foothill College and other and other fine community colleges do. That's Carmel. What about you? What would you like to say as a kind of a closing comment in this wonderful conversation that we've had? You know, it's so interesting because until until quite recently, I'm thinking to myself, my my world, I feel for lack of a better way of saying it, my world is so small, right? So I'm thinking, oh, well, I, I do what I do. I come from a Haitian family and we're all very successful within our own right. So for me, that's the norm, right? And I've been told before, Carmel, you're not normal. You're not like other black people. You know, you're educated. And I'm like, well, that's my normal. Like I'm around educated African-American, educated Haitian-American, educated black people. That is my norm. I've been told before, um, so you were talking about all this extra baggage, right? Besides just being human. Um, I've been told before, oh, how old are you? you listen, don't ever get fat. Don't, oh, you look great for your age. Don't, what, what, what is that? You would never say that to a man. This was a client that spoke to me this way. He would have never said that to a man. And I've been told, I used to wear my hair straight. The second I decided to use, to go with my natural curls, I was literally told, you know, you're gonna lose some clients with your hair like that. They don't like to see that type of hair. And I said, I'm sorry, Scott, but I have to repeat. I said, fuck them. 
They don't want to do business with me. Well, that's how I feel about the whole situation. Although I've never met anybody that told me, listen, I don't like your hair. I'm not going to do business with you. But I say all that to say, yes, there's just all this extra baggage that somebody such as you, Scott, you said it before, the privilege, right? That you'll never have to deal with because you don't come up, you don't come, you don't come packaged like this, right? So, um, and, and, and even with um, um, people who don't who don't associate male or female with male or female female people who don't associate as an African American or who are women of color people of color you know there's just all this all this extra stuff so then when I stop and think well I just had to do what I I just do what I do I'm never thinking that there's somebody out there that did not have to deal with all the extra nonsense that I have to yeah. deal with that I just take into stride because, hey, listen, it's all part of the package. You know, so there's there's a lot to be said for that as well that I can share with my um, women of color sisters, um, Dr. Tanya, Sneha. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about when I say this. Dr. Tanya, you work with money and it's uh, money is so powerful that they never expect a woman to understand and know money in that regard. So when you come already and people know that you work with money and government grants at that, oh my gosh, a powerhouse, a powerhouse. And you demand respect even before you utter a word simply because you work with the green. <laughs> Scott, I really want to thank you for this platform. Thank you, Saneha, for bringing us on. Thank you, Dr. Tanya, for being all that you are to me. And Sheena is amazing as well. I'm sorry she had to leave so early. So that is my piece. Thank you again. <laughs>